Hello and welcome to today's PV Magazine webinar, Reducing the Environmental Impact of PV Mounting Structures. I'm Becky Beats, Head of Content at PV Magazine, and I'll be moderating from Berlin today. Joining us for the third time is ArcelorMittal, a leading supplier of steel and a major actor in the solar industry. Moving on from the first two webinars where we address mounting structure durability and lifespans, the team is going to talk to us today about its foray into the world of low CO2 steel and present solutions to improve mountain structure design, durability, and environmental impact. In general, sustainability is fast climbing up the solar agenda. It's not only becoming increasingly essential to look at the entire life cycle of PV when making decisions about materials and products, with considerations like recycling, material circularity, and supply chain decarbonization. But it's also crucial to consider the implications of business decisions on our wider communities and ecosystems, i.e. embracing systemic thinking, which is a key aspect to sustainability. And with its circular ambitions, this is exactly what ArcelorMittal is turning its attention to. Indeed, one of the company's initiatives has been to launch the XCAR program, which encompasses circular carbon, carbon storage projects, and clean power generation. 10 billion has already been earmarked to reduce its European CO2 emission intensity by 35% by 2030 and to be carbon neutral by 2050. To talk more about the program, the company's green production methods and the XCARB green steel certificates will be Hugo Campos, Sustainable Development Manager at ArcelorMittal. Hi Hugo, and thank you for joining us from London today. Thank, thanks for having me, Oscar. Yeah, nice to have you here. Before we hand over to Hugo, however, we'll be joined by Corinne Ju, product leader for Metallic Coated Steels, who will focus on how the company is working, working to strengthen the corrosion resistance of its manganese coated steel to increase the lifetime of solar investments and the environmental benefits of manganese versus galvanized steel products. Welcome, Corinne, and thank you for joining us from Belgium today. Hello, Becky. Hello, everyone. Uh, kicking off the discussion today is Jer Jerome Guth, ArcelorMittal's solar segment leader, who will talk more widely about the topic of sustainability from the early design stages to end of life and the advantages of steel use over aluminium. He will also look at steps to improve the sustainability of solar mounting structures. Hi, Jerome, and thank you for joining us from Luxembourg today. Do we have Jerome here? Oh, yeah. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Becky. Hi, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you, Jerome. Uh, before we start, I would like to encourage all of our listeners to submit questions via our live chat window throughout the webinar, and we'll endeavor to pose as many as time permits. The recording and presentations will also be available to all our registrants after the event. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jerome. Thank you, thank you very much. And, and uh, let's start and um, indeed uh, go back a little bit. And uh, we're happy to be there for the third time together with uh, PV Magazine. Um, the last two webinars were focused on Manili's protective performance against corrosion and the different applications. Our topic for today is a little bit broader as we want to look at PV mounting systems under the uh, sustainability perspective. Why this topic uh, today? Um, sustainability has definitely become, in a few years, an increasingly strong driver in all sectors, and especially in building and constructions, with, for example, attention on, on thermal efficiency, waste management, speed of construction, nuisance, the use of natural resources is central, the quantity of materials, and what happens at the end of life. Uh, so at the end, uh, taking decision based on a full life cycle analysis and not purely on a, on a cost basis. It's not different in the solar sectors. The drivers are a bit different. Uh, we don't think about thermal efficiency or insulation, but some other dri drivers are very similar to building, like durability, resource efficiency, or low CO2 footprint of raw materials, again, over the life cycle. 
And today it has become obvious that it is a nonsense to build large solar production capacities aiming at reducing global CO2 emissions if at the same time the investments themselves are not designed with a sustainability concern. Anyhow, cost will remain, and this is true for all sectors. It's a common focus, no doubt. Uh, it will remain a target and a constraint, but it is now clearly balanced by the growing view, uh, the viewpoint of sustainability. When talking about sustainability in solar, one of the first topic uh, is, which is raised is about what happens at the end of life uh, for the PV panels. It is indeed a domain gaining more and more importance as more and more plants will arrive at, their, at the end of their life and because they will be retrofitted with new PV panel installed on existing installations. And as you can see on, on this page, uh, many countries in Europe, in India, in Korea, in Australia, are now putting in place rules and channels to collect, dismantle, sort, and valorize old PV panels. It's important, it's necessary to ensure that PV panels are fully included in the circular economy. But like one of these headlines is uh, saying, sustainability, sustainable PV goes beyond recycling of PV panels. So we will now see how and where to act to build more sustainably. And as a steel producer, of course, we will look at this topic from the mounting structure point of view, keeping in mind that it has become a significant metal consuming sector. The backbone of our presentation today will be structured around the life cycle. And we will first look at how during the engineering, construction and procurement steps, uh, we, you can and the, the engineers can indeed, by selecting materials properly, but optimizing the use of, that, of these materials and by selecting supplies properly, they can act on uh, the total CO2 footprint of the systems. Then Corinne will, will talk about what you can do during operation and maintenance and what durability is so long. And then Hugo will conclude about the aspects linked to the steel uh, Im impact itself. Let's uh, stay for a minute and go back to the PV panels themselves. As you know, most PV panels are built with an aluminum frame, which is necessary to hold and, and transfer the wind load, the snow loads, to the mounting structures. And as you can see again in this headline, a uh, huge quantity of PV panels are produced today and tomorrow, and this will lead to extremely high demand of aluminum. But aluminum has a very high CO2 footprint. 2020 world average data uh, reached 14 tons of CO2 per tons of aluminum, ranging between 20 for Chinese aluminum to six for European aluminum. So it is possible to reduce the CO2 footprint of PV panels by replacing these aluminum frames by steel coated with manulis that will ensure the durability. Indeed, manulis coated steel exhibit only 2.5 tons of CO2 per tons of steel. So there is almost a factor of four between the two metals. These are values that we publish in our environmental product declaration. And steel can easily fulfill the mechanical requirements of an extruded profile. And the manilis coating will provide the necessary production during the expected lifetime, 25 years and more, as we have shown previously. And this was illustrated in an uh, innovation award that uh, was uh, delivered in 2017 at InterSolar Europe, showing how it is possible to substitute an aluminum frame by a steel profiled frame made of manulis and reduce, as such, by 15% the CO2 footprint of that PV panels. 
and you will see the video, read the articles, see what solutions and how it was implemented uh, by uh, Anwa QCell at that time. In the case of rooftop solar systems, aluminum is steel and also widely used for mounting structures. Here also, there is a large potential to reduce the CO2 footprint of mounting structures. Several companies have demonstrated that steel, and manually coated steel in particular, can be material of choice for rooftop structures or for some components. It appears that the weight is not necessarily a concern, mainly for two reasons, because some systems are ballasted uh, when they are used on roof without damaging the roof itself and, and the tightness of the room. And the other reason is that with high strength steel, it's possible to reduce thicknesses and make very light structures and robust uh, at the same time. And we'll talk about this point uh, again later. In the field of ground mounted structures, the steel intensity in tons, expressed in tons per megawatt, is approximately 10 times higher than for rooftop structures. Of course, this ground mounted system includes foundations, uh, systems, rail tubes, transmissions. Also, utility scale systems represent two thirds of installed PV capacities globally per year today. Therefore, all in all, it represents huge quantity of steel, which is today the main raw material used for ground mounted uh, structures. Therefore, it is all the more important, one, to use steel in the most efficient and optimized way, and second, to select galvanized steels with the lowest CO2 footprint. And as you can read in this uh, article, the awareness of the full impact of solar energy generation is growing. Another emerging and very interesting aspect that is gaining ground among the supply chain of solar energy is that companies themselves now give more and more importance to the way they do business and the way they operate in their local environment and the way they select the suppliers. Solar Teal, for example, has recently won an award for the sustainable way of doing business. Human, social, environmental criteria and other are other aspects of sustainability not directly linked to the CO2 footprint, but nevertheless complementary and becoming more and more important, recognized and valorized today. Regarding the optimized use of raw materials and steel, it can be done at engineering stage by lightweighting the design. Lightweight can be achieved with higher strength steel while remaining strong, robust, to the wind and the snow loads. In order to demonstrate this and the benefit of using high strength steel, we have done the following study. We have designed a generic, simplistic, but realistic uh, structure. We have collected the loads, the wind loads, the snow loads that we have gotten from an external supplier because we are not a tracker company. We have designed with a reference grade, 350 megapascal. And we have then played with this model by adjusting the grade, the thickness, and eventually by modifying the geometry of the profiles and the tube sections. And we have done that for three key parts, for the rails supporting the PV panels, for the torque tubes, and for the poles. And we have indeed upgraded uh, the material grade to 450, 550, and even 700 megapascal yield strength. And this has allowed us to reduce the thickness, eventually um, optimizing the sections while keeping the same service limit uh, constraints and criteria and the same uh, ultimate limit uh, criteria as well. Let's look at the result of this study. For each part, you see for the rails uh, on the left, for the tubes in the middle and for the poles on the right, it has been possible to reduce the weight of the part significantly when using higher grades. And also by adjusting the geometry, it goes together. 
the weight reduction potentials are different for the different part, but you can see that rails could be lightened uh, from 25 up to 40% when jumping to 350 to 700 MPa. Tubes could be lightened from 13% when jumping from 350 to 550 level. And poles could be reduced from 6 to 13% by increasing from 350 to 550 uh, steel grades. And as you can directly imagine, the weight of this element, the weight of these parts, directly correspond and proportionally correspond to the equivalent CO2 content and footprint of these parts. So by upgrading the steel grade, you benefit immediately of a reduction of the CO2 footprint of the structures. We have also demonstrated that next and in parallel to this weight and CO2 footprint reduction, you can save on cost as well, because the material quantity decrease in percentage is much more important than the cost increase of the raw material itself. So the equation at the end is positive on weight, on CO2, and on cost. Before giving the floor to Corinne, I want to come back on the importance uh, part of the sustainability environment to properly select supplier upon how they do business. I mentioned the case of solar steel. I wanted also to take the opportunity to say that we as ArcelorMittal uh, in Europe, we have our plants in Belgium, Germany, uh, certified responsible steel from July last year. Again, demonstrating and, and proving how we operate uh, in our environment, taking into concern the human, the social uh, and environmental aspects. So Corinne, I give you now the floor to talk about the sustainability from durability point of view. Thank you very much, Jerome, for your insights there. Perhaps before we move on, you could just give us a, a bit of an insight into how much steel is used in a typical solar farm. This is a good question. I mentioned the proportion between rooftop and ground mounted systems. So definitely ground mounted structures are more steel intensive. The ratio expressed in ton per megawatt can vary between 30, 40, 50, depending on the wind loads, of course. The higher the loads, the stronger and the heavier the structures. So there is not a unique number, it's a range. Yeah, you can count between this 40, 50 tons per megawatt. Great, thank you very much. And um, we'll hear more from you later in the Q&A round. Right now, as Jerome mentioned, we're going to hand over to Curran Ju, product leader for metallic coated steels. Yes, hello everyone. We indeed, um, to follow um, the presentation, I will speak to you and present you results about durability, because durability is really a key feature in the sustainability of a mounting structure, because as you have seen on the previous slide from Jerome, a good, a robust product, a durable product will really allow at least a limited maintenance and much more uh, benefits for the solar structure. But about durability, uh, Magnelis is a direct answer, but to, to consider this answer is interesting to well see and uh, identify the different configuration in which the part can be placed in the solar structure and which kind of durability is expected in front of the corrosiveness. The first situation is when the part is exposed to the atmospheric condition. There you see on this table the summary of um, such behavior. In terms of atmospheric exposure, the corrosion category has been well defined, clarified by some standard as the ISO 9223, defining category from C2 up to C5. You see on this table on the left, the expected lifetime associated to two different kinds of galv conventional galvanized material. On the right, you see the expected lifetime from magnesium for coating ZM310 and ZM430. The values you find here in the table for galvanized material are in fact extracted from a recent standard, a DIN standard, you see the reference at the bottom of the slide, it's a recent one published in 2018, and when you look to the value to the expected lifetime of this product, you see that the protection given by such solution can be very limited, so you have a quite unrobust and unreliable protection in the perspective of the expected lifetime for solar, um, for solar structure. 
In parallel, when you look to the right, to the Magnelis expected lifetime, this value, we have um, ex extract them from all the knowledge we have built by exposing Magnelis material in more than 20 sites around the world. We have built a strong knowledge thanks to a real field exposure. And we have translated this knowledge in these values of range of expected lifetime um, for the different coating layers. And when you look to this uh, solution with Magnelis, you see that they are well in line. They are robust to give the expectation in terms of durability for the solar structure, it can, in some cases, also allow to think and to prepare a retrofitting of the solar structure by keeping the magnetic coated part and giving a new youngs to the to the solar structure and to the solar project. This uh, point of view, this knowledge we have built on the magnetic durability, we we need to have an external and we want to have a, an independent point of view, an independent input on this durability. And this is why we have asked also the magnetic to be certified by third parties. You see here two examples of such certification that magnetic has received. These documents are available for sure of our website. And you see on the left, um, the document we received from RICE, the Swedish authorities. And um, this uh, certificate we received in, is in fact um, confirming that the Magdalis ZM310 is compatible with a C5 environment. And Magdalis is in fact the only metallic coated steel which has been certified for such a C5 use. Currently, we are in contact with RICE and Authority in order to receive or further renewal of this certification. RICE Laboratory is regularly checking, following the performance of the Magnelis, and we are now at the step to receive the third time, third time the renewal of this certification. On the right, you see another certification from Germany, from the IBT Authority. This is a document that we have also presented to you during the previous seminar, but we wanted to share with you today another new information about the scope of this document, because it has been clarified and explicitly now defined in the scope of this certification that this is well valid and can be well used and considered for solar energy structure. So all the LGIBT recommendations that you can find in this document can now be well explicitly used and, and considered when defining a solar structure with magnetis. So atmospheric condition is one kind of configuration when you have to know more about the durability of the part. Another kind of situation for some parts in the solar structure are the one in contact with the soils. And when we have started with our magnetis to work on this topic, we realized that um, in a contrario with the atmospheric condition, the topic of the soil was much more limited in scientific knowledge. There were few quantitative norms, much um, less bibliography. And this is why 15 years ago, we decided to start uh, to develop our own expertise on the topic. You see on the left, that uh, the soil corrosivity is a more, much more complex phenomenon. You have a lot of interaction because the soil corrosivity depends on the soil composition, on the presence of not organic material. It's also influenced by the climate, climate around the soil. And this is why it was important for us to better know the soil corrosiveness and the magnetic behavior. This is why the R&D of ArcelorMittal has started uh, studies in our, our own labs, but also a lot in collaboration with independent bodies. The target was really to define new methodologies of testing, new test setup to use in lab in accelerated testing, but also define new methodology to test in real field exposure of the material we wanted to better know. On the right, you see some illustration, some example of the test we have launched to test and, and get measurement from real samples, from real profiles. And the target we are following during all this year is really to acquire a very deep knowledge, a proprietary knowledge about the topic and the magnetic behavior in such situations. But in fact, as for atmospheric condition, what was also interesting for us was to receive an external point of view on the magnetic performance. And so this is what um, what you see on the screen now. This is in fact a brand new document that we received recently from the French Corrosion Institute. Uh, this laboratory is certainly known by some of you. Of you, this is one of the largest laboratories in terms of expertise for in the field of corrosion, corrosion protection of materials. And you see here the statement which has been done by the French Corrosion Institute after all the studies they have made on the magnetic material. 
You see that uh, the statement is that the corrosion resistance of Magnelis in soil is improved by an average factor of 3.8, comparing the material with regular zinc coated materials. The document itself is also available on the website. You can have a look to, to it. But uh, such a statement is really confirming that uh, Magnelis has also a very good behavior in the soil, that it has a high durability expectation in also for this soil. Uh, Part in contact with soil, and so this is why we know um, are able to recommend and give advice on the use of magnesium uh, in contact with soil. All the knowledge we have built during via our different testing, um, we have used them, and we then can now really recommend to consider magnesium ZM430, ZM620, or above as recommended solution for the posts which are ramped in soils. The right selection of the good coating layers, the, the best solution depending on the soil, it's now an answer that we can give also thanks to a recent German standard which has been also published in 2018, you see it on the screen, and this German standard is now allowing to provide a quantitative categorization of the soil. Thanks to uh, minimal information on the soil parameter from a soil analysis, thanks to this standard, it's now possible to define um, and to rank the soil in terms of category from very low, low, medium or high corrosion load. And thanks to this information and placing it in parallel to the knowledge we have built on the magnesium behavior, we can now give advice and recommendation regarding the best coating layer to consider for the soil of the solar project. In the case of the soil is not adapted to ram post where it is too hard or not adapted for, uh, for ramming poles, and in the case of for solar structure when the foundation have to be in concrete, there also we have increased in knowledge, we have data, and we can also now give recommendation on the best coating layer of magnesium in contact with concrete foundations. So this is the second situation, but there is now also a, a new one, a third one, a new kind of corrosiveness that has to be um, better known in terms of durability and where also we, we have tested magnesium. This is in contact with water because more and more there are development of floating structure in some areas. There the corrosiveness is different and it was very important for us to know also the behavior of magnesium in such a situation. You see here on the screen two kind of results we get from our R&D studies. You see on the top left um, one result of test done in an offshore area. The sample presented here are placed in the blue rectangle, so they are exposed to the seawater, but mainly to the splashes of this seawater. And you see the result after one, two, three years of test. The way we are expressing here the result is the improvement ratio between the magnelis and the batch galvanized material placed in comparison. And you see that the improvement ratio of magnelis has been measured up to eight times better than batch galva, meaning that um, at the same moment, in the same condition, magnelis has been consumed eight times less to protect the steel in the same condition. So such a result is also uh, proving and showing that uh, magnesium is also an efficient solution if you have to develop a solar structure, a floating structure, for example, on brackish waters. On the bottom right, you see another kind of result we are re uh, receiving from our studies. This is the exposure of the magnesium to the water from a natural lake, some fresh water in such case. You see two graphs. On the left, you see the exposure of the material to a fully immersed situation, continuously in contact with the water. The second case on the right is a cyclic exposure, partial time in the, in the water, partial time in the dry situation. And again, you see the result expressed in terms of improvement ratio between the magnelis and batch galvanized material. And you see that in such a test with fresh water, we had an improvement ratio up to 22 times better behavior of the magnesium in the, in the test and in the situation of contact with the fresh water, proving also that magnesium can be a very efficient solution when um, developing floating structure part for fresh, sweet water without specific content of source. So these are 
very different point of view on the durability, depending which part of the solar structure we are uh, thinking about, in contact with the atmosphere, in contact with the soil, or in contact with the water. But in each case, we have seen that the durability of the magnetis was very good, well in line with the expectation for a solar structure. And it was an important element in terms of support of the sustainability for the solar structure. But there are other benefits and other advantages next to the durability itself. And this is uh, what we, we would like to present you today with such a summary. These are the other environmental benefits when using magnelis, comparing it with the conventional galvanized material. On the left, you see, in fact, the impact in terms of zinc runoff of the material. When using a magnelis coated material rather than a galvanized coated material, you see here the difference in terms of dissolution of the zinc from your surface and this dissolution from the zinc released to the soil and water around the solar structure. And we see that the way magnelis uh, is acting and reacting um, is in fact a good way to preserve and to better use the zinc content of the, of the coating and to have like that a good impact also during the lifetime of the solar structure. On the middle, it's another point of view. It's a comparison um, in terms of environmental product declaration. You see here a comparison we made between a magnelis ZM250 and a galvanized material Z600, 600 grams per square meter. So this comparison has been done because these two coatings are quite similar in terms of corrosion protection, so their durability is quite similar. And here you see per square meter what are the, the value linked to the environmental impact of the coating process of these two materials. The methodology has followed the material from cradle to gate, and we have used for this calculation a life cycle assessment model, which has been approved by IBU Independent Network. So again, this importance to have a third party validation from our work. On this spider web, in fact, you see in blue what are the, the impact from the galvanized material, but here you consider it as a reference. So at 100% of impact, whatever the environmental parameters. But in orange, you see what becomes this impact when considering the coating via a magnelis ZM250 layers. And you see that for each environmental impact, there is a really a positive effect, a reduction, positive influence when using magnelis rather than galva. And one of the most significant difference is considering the parameter linked to the consumption of scarce resources. There you can observe a 61% reduction of the impact, environmental impact, thanks to the magnelis use, especially linked to the, the use and the lower use of uh, scarce raw material as disease. On the right, another point of view that we found interesting to share with you today, this is the, the fact that magnelis is also ROHS compliance. ROHS means a restriction of hazardous substance. Initially, this is um, a compliancy which is mainly asked for electronic, um, electrical equipment. But in the global perspective of the environmental impact of magnelis, we found interesting also to mention to you that magnelis has this ROHS compliancy. This point of view, we can also complement it in another kind of perspective. This is considering the magnelis um, as alternative to batch galvanized material. And there you see a kind of summary also of the different benefits thanks to the magnelis um, selection. On the top of this uh, slide, you see the difference in terms of routings between these two ways to produce and deliver metallic coated material for solar structure. And you see that thanks to this difference of routings, to the fact that the magnelis is a continuous and integrated uh, process of coating, there are directly uh, uh, numerous benefits to the use of magnelis. Cost reduction, because less zinc, less transport, less manpower. Also some time saving, because the logistic is simplified and the project management can be shorter and easier. But also the way we are producing and coating um, the, the material allows us 100% online surface quality control. So you have also a direct benefits in terms of robustness of the product deliver on site. The process also we are using to coat and to apply this magnetic layer on the steel also allow us um, a full compatibility, whatever the, the steel grade below uh, the, the coating. Uh, full compatibility with all the high strength steel, so meaning a large freedom in terms of design of the part when combined with magnelis. 
In terms of geometrical tolerances also, we have a, a, a higher respect of these tolerances and there is no constraint at all in terms of design when preparing the design of the part and thinking about the way to install or to prepare it. No constraint in this are due to the magnetic selection. So these are direct benefits, but again, uh, regarding the durability, the sustainability of the structure, in comparison with batch galvanized material, there is also positive environmental impact thanks to the magnesium. And this is what, uh, what you see on the right. You see there also for the coating process, the comparison in terms of environmental impact between two products, which are also quite equivalent in corrosion protection. In grey, you see as reference what are the impact of a batch galvanized material with 70 microns of zinc. This is a reference considered at 100% of impact. And in red, you see what becomes each of this environmental impact when we consider the coating with a magnetic ZM430, so 35 microns of magnetic layer. And you see that again, in this case, we have a direct a significant a systematic reduction in the environmental impact thanks to the magnetic selection and the coating process of from, from magnetic uh, production. So you see that uh, these are different perspectives, different point of view, but whatever the, the, the point of view we take on the magnetic, uh, we see that uh, it's really a strong and a reliable uh, solution to support the, the sustainability of the mountain structure. Next to the specific interests linked to the magnetis, um, our company ArcelorMittal is working much more largely with a lot of action to reduce the environmental fo footprint of our steel and to act on the decarbonization. And on this part, this is why I will let, um, let the floor to Hugo Campos, which is a really sustainable development expert. So, Hugo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen. Perhaps before we move on, um, there's a few questions coming in just about the coating resistance of magnolies, particularly regarding drilling into soil that perhaps contains rocks, which could weaken or eliminate the coating. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a bit about that? And also, if there is damage, should the, the um, coating be replaced? So indeed, there are some some soil including much more rocks and which could damage more the surface and this, uh, this is a kind of situation configuration that we tested also with magnetis. What we have seen is that in terms of hardness the coating is more hard uh, as a harder resistance compared to zinc layers so meaning that the, the sensitivity of the coating is itself is lower to the scratches so it will be less damage uh, during the same kind of operation the same kind of ramming operation but in case of scratch indeed we have also continued the testing and we have seen that um, the coating was able to protect this damages area. We have what we call a kind of self-healing effect. So the area which could become bare because of big scratches could be also uh, reprotected than to the self-healing effect of the, of the coating. So we have some result of test after scratches the material, testing in corrosion, and, and we see that it will be also an efficient protection, efficient protection for, for the surface of the material. Thank you, Corinne. Um, as you mentioned, we're going to pass over to Hugo now, um, the Sustainable Development, Development Manager at ArcelorMittal. So the floor is yours, Hugo. Thanks very much, Becky. Um, so in my part of the presentation here, I just want to um, first zoom out a bit and give you uh, an overview of what ArcelorMittal is doing in terms of our climate action strategy and then to present to you a few specific um, CO2 related product offers that, that we have in the market. So firstly, just to, um, I, I'd like to make it really clear that as a company, we're fully serious about taking climate action. And to that end, we've announced a really ambitious set of CO2 reduction targets. So for the group, we, our aim is to be um, net, to reach net zero emissions by 2050 and then by 2030 to reduce the CO2 emissions at group level by 25%. In Europe, where the policy environment is slightly um, different, we're able to have a, a slightly stronger target, and, and for Europe, we have a 35% CO2 reduction target by 2030. But of course, to, to back up those targets, it's not just talk. We're really putting um, a huge amount of investment behind those targets, um, really an amount of investment that's unprecedented in the steel industry. In order to achieve our 2030 target, we've announced 10 billion euros of investments, 
this is really a lot focused on, on, on many different projects, but with a big focus on, on hydrogen um, direct reduction, which I'll come on to explain. Um, meanwhile, we're also very aware of the fact that customers need CO2 reductions today that they're not always you know, willing to wait um, for, for these big CapEx investments to happen and that we need to be able to deliver CO2 reduced steels um, effective immediately. And that there is a real growing market for that. So for that reason, we've launched two um, offers uh, under our what, what we call our X-Carb brand. And those two offers are the X-Carb green steel certificates, which are available already today, and the X-Carb recycled and renewably produced, which will be available in the second half of this year. Alongside all of that, we, we also recognize the importance for our customers of having accurate um, product level CO2 data. You know, we, we're fully aware that for customers, the CO2 footprint of the material that they're buying is of, the, is of critical importance. Um, and in order to accurately calculate the carbon footprint of their products, they, they need good solid product level data from the material suppliers. So that's why as Arslamittal, we've developed a lot of in-house experience in calculating life cycle assessments and environmental product declarations. And we have a dedicated team within Global R&D um, who, whose focus is on producing these LCA studies and the EPDs. And as Jerome and Corinne have already explained, we have a wide range of EPDs available, including EPDs for, for Magnellis, which we publish on our website. Um, in terms of then, in terms of our our sort of broader target to reach net zero um, and and the way in which we can produce carbon neutral steel, this will really require a complete transformation of the steel production process. And this is something that as a company we're dedicated to um, and are in the process of, of undergoing. We describe this transformation according to these um, five uh, levers that you see on the screen here. So the first refers to a steel making transformation. And this is really a step change um, that's not been seen in the steel industry for over a hundred years, you know, since the, the Bessemer process was invented. The, the, the fundamental thing about the steel making transformation is a switch from the existing blast furnace production route towards the electric arc furnace um, production route using direct reduced iron. As well as the steel making transformation, there's also a transformation there in our raw materials mix in that by switching from, um, from blast furnace to electric arc furnace DRI, that's also requiring a shift you know, from sinter and, 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 and those materials to iron ore pellets. In order for that steel making transition to then deliver the CO2 reductions that we want, we also require a huge energy transformation because in order to produce that direct reduced iron, we need hydrogen, and how that hydrogen is produced then has a big, um, uh, a big determination of the CO2 footprint. Clearly, um, we know that the, the, the lowest possible CO2 emissions can be achieved by using green hydrogen. This is um, hydrogen produced using electrolysis with renewable uh, electricity, but there are kind of three options. So the, 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 the green hydrogen, then also continuing to produce hydrogen using fossil carbon, but, but coupling that with carbon capture storage technology. And then finally, a third option, which would be um, what we describe as circular carbon, where you use um, biomass to sequester um, the, the carbon emissions and, and, and reach a, a kind of net zero that way. We're very focused on, on all three of these avenues, but, but in terms of the green hydrogen, it's really clear that in order for this to, to become viable, the, the world needs huge amounts of additional renewable energy capacity, and that that needs to be made available at, at affordable prices. Um, we, we published an, an estimate on a figure of what it would require um, for the European steel industry to transition to green hydrogen in terms of energy infrastructure investment. And that figure was between 450 and 700 billion euros of energy infrastructure investment. So you see it's a huge scale that we're talking about here. The third lever is increasing the use of scrap. So we can continue to optimize the use of recycled scrap steel in the blast furnace and the basic oxygen furnace process, but also optimizing the use of scrap in the electric arc furnace DRI routes. In doing that, we have to also recognize that scrap is a limited resource. 
and that um, the steel demand will continue to outweigh the scrap availability for many years to come. What that means is then that in order to produce steels, especially the, the high performance steels like Magnellis, this will need to be done using, uh, using propor high proportions of iron ore. Um, and, and, and therefore, that's why the focus of our decarbonization transformation is on this DRIEAF route. The fourth lever is what we describe as clean electricity. So once we have done this transition from the blast furnace basic oxygen furnace to the electric arc furnace DRI, that will increase the electricity needs of the steel production process because we're going from a blast furnace, which is powered with, with um, fossil coal and cokes towards an electric arc furnace, which requires electricity. It's paramount then that the electricity that we use to power the EAF is then coming from clean sources. Um, and to do that, we have a big focus on guarantees of origin and setting up power purchase agreements for the EAFs that we're constructing. Finally, the, the fifth lever to reach sort of true carbon neutral net zero steel um, is, is based on the fact that there will be some residual emissions left over that are either not technologically feasible to abate or, or where the costs are prohibitively high. We estimate that that will be less than 5% of the total emissions, but nonetheless, if we want to reach full zero, then um, an element of offsetting will be needed. And for that, our intention is to use high quality carbon offsets from, from recognized projects. So that has that, that, that sort of described the, the broader transformation that we're seeing. And I, I now want to explain two very specific product offers that we, that, that we have available for our customers. The first is the XCARB Green Steel Certificates. Like I say, these are available already today and have been on the market since the end of last year. Um, these certificates are, are based on major investments that we're making on the existing blast furnace assets. So we offer these certificates for steels that have pr been produced in that blast furnace route. The investments that we're making are, are focused um, uh, today on gas injection where we replace some of the fossil coal needs of the blast furnace with gases, either natural gas or coke oven gas, which is a byproduct of the uh, coke plant within the steel um, operations. And we can use that gas to then replace some, some of the coal, creating a CO2 saving. The, the second type of project contributing to these certificates is what we call Torero. This is a biomass project where we use waste wood and we inject that into the blast furnace again to replace some of the fossil coal that's currently being used. And the third and final project is what we describe as Carbolist. This is a carbon capture utilization technology where we can capture the CO2 emissions coming from the stacks of the blast furnace and then using a, a biological process, transform that into uh, bioethanol. And then with that bioethanol, we can produce polyethylene and various types of plastics or valorize the bioethanol as a biofuel. The CO2 savings that these projects are generating, we have independently verified by a third party auditor. The auditor we use for this is DNV, the Norwegian audit company. Um, and we think it's really important to have that aspect of independence when you're making CO2 calculations like this. What these certificates then enable our customers to do is to make a reduction in their scope three emissions um, up to the total amount of the crude steel production phase, which represents about 2.1 tons of CO2 uh, per ton of, of, of XCARB green steel certificates. So this is a really significant CO2 saving that we're able to offer to our customers that they can then valorize in their scope three accounting. And like I said already, these certificates are available um, today and they're available with Magnellis and can be supplied from any um, uh, production route and any site producing Magnellis within ArcelorMittal Europe. The market reaction so far to these certificates has been really positive. Um, we, 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 we have been able to sell a lot of volumes and we're getting a very good reaction from the market. And you'll find on our website some customer testimonials from, from some clients who are already purchased and, and are now using these certificates. On the next slide, I, I then want to explain the, the second offer we have, which is XCARB recycled and renewably produced. Now, whereas with the green steel certificates, that was for steels produced in the blast furnace route, the XCARB recycled and renewably produced is for the steels that we can offer produced in the electric arc furnace route. And within ArcelorMittal Europe flat products, we have an electric arc furnace in Sestau, which is producing hot rolled coils. 
and the plan here is, is, is to um, power the EAF with 100% renewable electricity and then to produce the products with a very high proportion of recycled scrap. When we do those two things, we're then able to deliver a CO2 footprint as low as 500 kilograms of CO2 per tonne of hot rolled coil, which of course is, is, is extremely low compared to conventional steels, uh, to conventional rolled steels, uh, and also very low even compared to uh, conventional steel produced in the electric arc furnace because we're using that 100% uh, renewable electricity. And that 500 um, kilograms of CO2 figure I've just given is based on, 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 on a life cycle assessment. So this is, um, this is uh, uh, a cradle to gate um, uh, calculation. We can offer a variety of different coatings using this substrate from ArcelorMittal Sestal, um, including Magnellis, uh, and we can supply that then with an environmental product uh, declaration that's verified by a third party. Hugo, sorry, just to interrupt you quickly. Um, if we could speed up a wee bit, just so we've got some time for the Q and A at the end, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So the, the thank final you. slide I had before handing over to Jerome was just to remind um, everybody of the end of life benefits of steel. So obviously, Corinne spoke a lot about the durability, but also to remember that steel is infinitely recyclable. Magnetic properties make it really easy to sort and collect, uh, and it's not downgraded um, when we recycle it. So this is another Sort of environmental benefit of, of, of using Magnellis. Um, with that, I'll then just quickly hand over to, to Jerome to give the conclusion. Thank you, Hugo. So reducing the environmental impact of solar structures has definitely become a must. Uh, and to do that, uh, we propose different angles and, and possibilities. Uh, by using Magnellis, you will have a highly protected coating that's proven in atmospheric, in soil, in contact with water. And also, it's a low environment impacting coating because it uses less resources. Second, we offer high strength steel. Engineers can design and optimize the use of material, the quantity of raw materials, and this is directly reducing the CO2 impact. We offer a full range from 350 to 700 MPA grades. Finally, we are, we are re engineering our steel production process step by step. And uh, we already today propose the Green Sea certificate to reduce the CO2 footprint of your company. And we also develop recycle and renewably produced steels and manuals in particular, with, as you have seen, a significantly lower CO2 footprint than today. Uh, so all in all, you can uh, work with us, continue developing the most efficient and sustainable mounting structures. Thank you, and, and let's hand over to Q&A. Thank you very much, Jerome, and also to Hugo and Corinne. We have to um, end very punctually today at four, and there are a lot of questions that have come in. So to the listeners that we don't get to answer your questions to today, we will send out the emails of our speakers so that you can follow up afterwards. Um, I think um, there's been a lot perhaps to invite Corinne to come and, and, and answer now in the, the Q&A. There's been a lot of questions around salt water and the performance of mag magnolies in salt water. Um, can you talk a bit about the long-term protection of the rammed or, or steel parts within the, the, the salt water itself or within the soil and coast areas, uh, coastal areas and what its stability is? So indeed, as you have seen, we, we are making tests. We have started and continuing many tests on that. Uh, the recommendation and the knowledge we have today is really um, uh, knowing that the product can be well adapted with uh, brackish water, so not uh, strictly uh, fully uh, seawater, but brackish is already uh, a severe environment where magnetis can be used. And there, for sure, the, the selection of the right coating has to be done. We have seen that as for soil, ZM430, 620 or above uh, can become the, the right solution to have the good durability in the, in, in the water of the solar project. So in such a case of, um, for example, floating structure, to better estimate the, the durability, the way we start to proceed is to know a little bit more, ask some questions about the water, 
where is the project, what is the type of water that uh, which the, the Magdalis uh, will be partly in contact. And thanks to this data, we can there uh, de estimate and give a better um, personalized answer regarding the durability of the Magdalis part in, in the floating structure discussed for the project. So there is no more in terms of durability, but we can adapt our answer depending the knowledge of the water analysis and like that adapting our answer and the recommendation of the best uh, magnetic coating to consider. Thank you. Um, so there's been a couple of questions coming in about the scope for using 3D printed steel structures um, for an application in solar and, and um, that the approach is being used for some car and rocket manufacturers. Um, is this a, a move in the steel industry for solar as well? Yes, 3D printing is a fascinating topic, offering plenty of, of new possibilities to optimize the use of materials for structural parts. Uh, we are working on that. We have a dedicated R&D center uh, elaborating uh, new parts and new uh, possibility with 3D printing. Uh, is, it, is it a possibility and a technology for solar? Yes, why not? There are lots of mechanical parts who deserve this kind of technology for uh, really optimizing uh, the, the use of material and the use of iron, yeah. Thank you. Um, Hugo, looking at the, um, sorry, um, uh, how you measure the environmental impact of mounting systems, what tools and methodologies do you use? Yeah, so, so um, what we do is we do a life cycle assessment. So, so what's really important when we're talking about product level CO2 emissions is, is not only counting the direct emissions from the steel production process, but also looking upstream and counting the emissions from, uh, for example, the electricity we consume or the energy we consume, as well as the raw materials that we're using and the transportation of those raw materials to our gates. So that's really what we mean by a life cycle assessment. And the system boundary we use is, is called cradle to gate, so right from the mine site up to the gates of the steel plant. And for Magnellis, we then publish this EPD, which is which has been referenced. This is then following the Euro norm standards for EPD calculations, uh, and we have this then verified by a third party, which is EBU, uh, the, the the German authority on on EPDs. Thank you. Uh, Karun, are PV mountain structures the biggest application from, for Magnus, um, or what other applications is it used for? Solar application and solar structures, different solar parts uh, are indeed uh, an important uh, use of Magnelis uh, worldwide, but it's, it's not the only one. So it's true that we have a more and more very different application in building application, in industry, general industry, uh, for which Magnelis uh, becomes a good and efficient solution. So solar is really a, a part indeed of the important development of magnetis but it's not it's not the only one and we have a, a very different application also in building structure uh, uh, building indoor application uh, many, many different situations so i know jerome on this point if you want to complement yes definitely heat ventilation system agricultural environment very aggressive deserve high protections infrastructures also designed to last long uh, also are, are very suitable for using uh, manilis and switching from post galvanization which is again a thick but not necessarily efficient coatings towards a, a more efficient coating like manilis so yeah definitely plenty of opportunity when it's axe aggressive hot humid uh, salty marine that's definitely where manilis mm -hmm. makes full sense Thank you. Um, there are a lot of other questions coming in. Um, like I said, we've really run out of time now for today. And I do encourage our listeners to contact um, Hugo, Jerome and Corinne afterwards when we send around the link to the webinar um, recording to ask your questions that haven't been answered today. Um, and I would like to say um, thank you very much to Jerome Guth and Corinne Ju and Hugo Campos for your insights into reducing the environmental impact of PV mountain structures. Um, and I would also like to thank our listeners for their participation and their questions today. As I mentioned, the recording and presentations will be emailed to all registrations, uh, all registrants after the event. 
Um, and before we go, I would like to point you to our news websites and magazine where we cover all the developments in the solar PV industry, including sustainability. You may read the articles highlighted on the current slide by scanning your QR code. And we're all also offering all listeners a 10% discount on the magazine today with the code webinars10. Next up in our webinar program, we'll be looking at N-Type Topcon solar modules on February the 17th and a new Fraunhofer study focusing on multi versus single MPPT inverters on February the 28th. So in closing, many thanks to all of you for having attended our event, for your engagement and your questions. When we close the webinar, a brief poll will open up and it would be wonderful if you could share your feedback with us. And on that note, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Okay.